Hello, can you hear us? Yes, it's okay. In the back too. Okay, good. I think we should start because it's five o'clock. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to see that you last uh, this long. I know it's the last uh, time slot, and uh, looks like the force is with you. So I'm happy. Uh, and welcome to our presentation to microservices with Kafka. I'm Dan, he's uh, Robert, and uh, we are here to uh, tell you our story about this uh, amazing uh, message broker. It's not, we will talk, we will not talk about uh, actually some sort of tutorial about microservices or about Kafka, but what was our uh, decision in choosing Kafka and also what we added to Kafka to make it count and uh, make it actually uh, useful for our uh, use cases within ING, of course. Um, I will start with a yeah, short intro. He's Robert. He's uh, more than 10 years uh, experience uh, software engineer. He worked in multinational uh, companies like IBM, uh, ING, one and one. He likes to design complex applications, but uh, he enjoys even uh, more to do the coding, to implement it. Uh, and also, he's a proud uh, family guy. He has three kids, and very proud of it. I am Dan. Uh, I am also uh, a software enthusiastic. I like a lot traveling and uh, my bike, as you can see. Also, I enjoy... Uh, I have two kids, and I am a proud, uh, let's say, family man. What we have in common is that we both love, we love Java, we both love software development, and um, we both love Kafka. And we work uh, for ING Software Development Center in Romania. I don't know how many of you know. Romania is an uh, IT hub in uh, Eastern Europe, actually, not only in Eastern Europe. Uh, and we have most of uh, multinational big uh, software companies uh, there. And uh, just to give you an idea of how important programming and software development is in Romania, I can tell you that uh, with 100,000 people, we are producing like almost 5% of our GDP <coughs> with a population of 18 million. So just to have, have an idea on uh, the size. As compared to agriculture, which is a very popular segment in Romania, with uh, almost 2 million people, we are producing like 4.4 uh, out of GDP. Uh, OK, and that's it about Romania. When we started this journey with uh, a project like one year and a half, we had in mind a lot of no, not fancy, let's call it common sense things. For example, performance, or fault tolerance, or uh, scalability, or uh, self-healing. These were some buzzwords and uh, like a must have for our application. That's why uh, when we started it, uh, let's say the journey, we uh, analyzed different uh, architecture possibilities and for the purpose of this presentation, I'll give you only two uh, options that we had. And uh, we have, yes, I'm sure you all know this character. She's a very beautiful lady for some, <laughs> for some brave knights. Uh, the important thing is that she's a princess. And uh, the princess, princesses are uh, very are unique. Actually, there are uh, in high demand. There are um, uh, priceless, right? And uh, it's a one of a kind. And also, there are high maintenance. Uh, so, if we make a short uh, analogy, a princess will be something like a monolithic application. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, of course, monolithic applications have uh, their own advantages. I don't believe there is a tool or architecture that will serve or will uh, deliver everything. Uh, so definitely 
we should use proper tool, proper architecture to, prop, to do the proper job. I think this, this is bottom line. So I'm not here to criticize uh, uh, monolithical applications, uh, but yes, they have their advantages. I mean, they, they have a, a, you have the same stack. It's easy to uh, work with. Everything is somehow connected. This, of course, can be also a side uh, a disadvantage. However, uh, even though monolithic application had uh, these um, advantages, and not to mention that we are working in a bank, and as you know, banks have, even ING also, ha still has a lot of monolithic uh, applications. I mean, they are changing, but banks are not moving that fast as uh, big software uh, companies, as you know. And uh, another, options that, another option that we had, actually, was uh, this guy. This guy, what's his story, uh, besides being funny, uh, it's, um, his name is Donkey, by the way, and uh, he's doing uh, one thing, and one thing only. Uh, I, if I recall, it's uh, getting Shrek out of his uh, nerves. Uh, also, he's cheap, so he doesn't uh, need a lot of cost to maintain it. And also, I can replace it with somebody else. So it's quite common, which is good, which is what I want. So again, if I turn to my analogy, I can compare this uh, magnificent donkey with a uh, microservice. Of course, I'm not saying that microservice uh, is the uh, best solution out there, and that, yes, if we have a microservice, then we are okay. Even though it's, uh, everybody is using these days microservices, I think they still have their limitations. Um, and yeah, there are use cases where you wouldn't uh, use them. But uh, for what we had to do, like uh, highly scalable application, uh, loose coupling, availability, I mean, this kind of feature uh, was uh, very good. So uh, having this donkey uh, in place, I can uh, take an example, like since we are working in a bank, I'll take a banking example. And uh, I will ask you to think of uh, a solution, which is a yeah, use case. Let's say I want to transfer some money from my account to Robert, or better from Robert's account to my account. It's safer then. And um, of course, in um, a bank, I will need some sort of components to do that. We have this account manager component, which basically does things like, I don't know, balance inquiry, some validation of the accounts, and so on. We have the core banking, which, yes, like any bank, you need to have the, those actual accounts are, uh, they live within core banking. And we have some uh, transfer component, for example, which, in our case, uh, can, has this logic of transferring money from one, one part to another. As you can see, these three are somehow connected they work, uh, uh, they work together, and their power comes from uh, their number. So used, isolated, they don't do much, but when I combine everything, then I have the real power. However, there is also a, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it downside. It's something that maybe some people miss when using microservices is communication. I mean, because these guys, I mean, they need to communicate. Doesn't matter how good that account manager is, how fast it can cope with whatever, if to perform an, an operation, he needs to talk with those other two guys, then, of course, communication comes into the loop. So, and it becomes very important to have a very, very fast uh, communication. In ING, we have, I don't know, tens, maybe hundreds uh, of, uh, of microservices, I mean, worldwide as a group. But if you think uh, this is much, I can uh, give you some example. For example, you take Halo. Halo is a uh, Uber-like uh, company, uh, which offers a simple platform uh, where, I don't know, drivers and customers meet uh, and, yeah, uh, they can uh, talk to each other. Halo uses around, uh, I can even count from here, like uh, 450 uh, microservices. 
And as you imagine, uh, they need to talk to each other. And uh, yeah, to talk to each other, you have like, a, looks like a mess was there. So this means this is a, a uh, I want to highlight the communication that we have between microservices. So it's quite, quite important. Also, we have, for example, Netflix or, uh, or Twitter, which have more than 500 uh, microservices. But if we look, I was thinking, how much they do communicate to each other. Well, Twitter, for example, has like 500 million messages per day, while Netflix, 700 billion, so just a short increase, while LinkedIn, 1.4 trillion which is, yeah, what can I say? Definitely, they talk a lot. Um, and these, all these three, what they have in common, it's Kafka. So I'm sure they use Kafka because Kafka has, <laughs> it's fully packed with uh, features, and uh, it can, Kafka can do almost uh, anything. So I can um, show you a short, comparison between Kafka and other message brokers in terms of features. For example, multiple protocol support. As you can see, we compare Kafka with FQMQ and RabbitMQ. Kafka doesn't have support for uh, multiple protocols. What about support for JMS? Well, ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, yes, they have it. Kafka doesn't again. So, uh, second red ball. Then, the part of uh, author authentication authorization. Again, it's missing. Transactions, no. Filtering, no. Then maybe you can think why I would use Kafka. Well, I can tell you one thing. It's not persistence, even though it has it. It's something else which we call, we like to call performance. That is the key asset that Kafka has, performance. And uh, how much performance? Well, on the left side, you can see a use case when we are trying to produce like 10 million messages. And of course, we are trying to produce it using Kafka, ActiveMQ, and uh, RabbitMQ. You will see there that for Kafka, we have two measures. So we are, batch, we are creating a batch of messages, of 50 messages, and a batch of one. Why we do this? Because uh, to, to show you, even with one message, what is the difference between Kafka and his competitors in terms of performance. So as you can see with one message, uh, a, a batch of one message, Kafka can do like, I don't know, 5,000, uh, yeah, 15,000 uh, messages. And having a batch of one, it's quite inefficient because each time you have a new message, you will send it to the broker each time you have it. So Kafka, what it do is to optimize this, it prepare, prepares a batch, right, of messages and sends it as a whole to the server. And this way with 50,000, uh, sorry, with uh, uh, 50 uh, messages, we have like more than 450 uh, messages sent. Uh, then on the right side, you will see the same use case. So 10 million messages being consumed by these brokers. So again, Kafka, uh, I think it's quite high compared to 25, uh, 22,000 uh, messages consumed compared with uh, the other brokers. So definitely the key thing that Kafka has it is performance, and that was the main reason for which we have chosen uh, Kafka. However, you saw that, uh, okay, it has performance, but it lacks features, so no features. Okay, Kafka, it's an open source solution, you can get it, use it, however, it doesn't give you added value because you will always have a boss, a company or whatever, they, I want that, that and that, I want that and that and that and whatever. So you will always need to add something to it. I mean, it's not just get it from the open source, use it, oh yes, this is my perfect. Especially if we are working uh, in a bank. So definitely we had to work on a lot on the feature side. And we saw 
that this is possible, that that's the great thing about open source, is that it's open for extension. So I can extend it to the degree that I, it will be useful for my need. And I will let uh, Robert, later on, uh, continue with the use cases that we have to give you a hint of uh, what we actually added to Kafka to make it uh, useful for us. Robert. Hi. Um, actually, what uh, Dan, what didn't mention is that this is, this comparison is from 2011. And actually, in 2014, the guys from Confluent, the guys that are developing Kafka, they showed the use case where they tuned up to more than 2 million messages per second. Um, so it's quite performant. But still, we have performance, mm -hmm. but uh, not too many features. So first of all, what were our needs in terms of uh, Yes, sorry. Uh, our laptop didn't work here, so this is another laptop. Sorry. Um, well, first of all, we, we started with the use cases that we needed to fulfill. Uh, first of these use cases was that we had to uh, make to communicate to microservices in unidirectional way, meaning sending a message and receiving a message, of course. Uh, then the other use case was that we needed also uh, that to the communication to be directional. And of course, we also had the situation where we needed something like fire and forget, uh, meaning sending an event and uh, one, more, one or more uh, services could uh, respond to that event. And uh, well, this is nice. These are some pretty uh, simple use cases, and you may wonder, okay, then why we didn't use REST? Because for fulfilling these requirements, you could use REST uh, simply. So uh, let's uh, have a simple example. We have service A, which sends a message to service B. Service B do, does some processing, and it will save to a database. Well, if we are looking at this, uh, then we will notice Quite sorry, we will notice quite soon that. Sorry for this technical. No, no, uh, You will notice that. Sorry. Uh, first of all, that this communication is uh, synchronous, and. Yeah. Sorry, we didn't find the mouse pointer. Okay. We have, sorry, uh, so uh, as I saw, the first problem was that um, we have a, uh, a pro it's a synchronous uh, communication. Well, this will arise uh, to two issues with this. First, it means that service A now requires uh, that service B to be up and running. So this means that it's uptime, it's dependent on service B. Uh, the other uh, issue that we see with this is that service A cannot respond until after service B responds to it. So this means that its performance is dependent on service B. And this could raise some other uh, questions. Uh, things like how often does service B is down for maintenance? How many time is down for failures? Uh, what is its peak performance? Uh, does it actually respond or uh, is just uh, pretend to respond just to, to be able to make the look that its performance is, uh, is higher? Uh, does it depend on any services on its own? Which means that the coupling goes even further than that. And what we can tell is that a service like this is only as good as its weakest service. Uh, having Kafka, on the other hand, well, Kafka has a, has a uh, uh, has the topics, as some of you may know. Uh, it's like a queue in GMS, uh, but uh, actually has. Uh, 
has a trick up its in sleeves. A Kafka topic is persistent by default, meaning that a message that arrives to Kafka is persisted almost instantly. So this means that service A has to only uh, make sure that his message will arrive to Kafka and then eventually service B will take that message and it will process it and save it to a database. So first of all, service A doesn't even have to know that service B actually exists. And this will decouple uh, it. Then the other thing that we need to consider is scalability. Well, most likely when you start to get a lot of loads, what is the first thing that you do? You start at more B services. Well, if you are using REST, this means that uh, you have to add a load balancer. You actually have to reconfigure your application so that we'll be able to talk now to the load balancer. The load balancer, on the other hand, needs to be able to monitor your services and so on, uh, which could be complicated. Actually, if you were this morning at Josh Lang's talk, uh, currently it looks to be a bit more simpler if you are using uh, cloud native Java. Uh, but um, usually, if you are not uh, on, uh, on the Spring side, then it's quite complicated to do it. And even with Spring, you still have to do some configurations for having and not talking about when you have another service that you want to couple again that needs the same message. In that case, you will need to reconfigure again so that it will send the message also to the G service. With Kafka, on the other hand, um, well, the Kafka topic by default is able to, uh, to, uh, to fulfill a, a request from multiple consumers. You just can plug in your consumer on a topic and it will just consume that message without any need of, of configuration from the A services point of view. Yes, you have to do some configuration on the Kafka itself so that it will allow you to communicate with, uh, to accept more consumers. But beside that, from the application's point of view, you have to do nothing. And in case you have, you need someone else to consume the, say, that same message, well, you just hook it up and it will consume without any change for the service A. So this means that this shows us that actually it's a great advantage out of using uh, Kafka compared to REST. And even more, this will allow us to do actually another use case is to log the messages uh, via Kafka and then goes to an uh, Elk stack, Elasticsearch log stash Kibana. Um, and actually, what, why we needed that was first because, uh, well, we having a lot of microservices, they are logging a lot of information. Um, all these, of course, from regulatory perspectives needs to be stored and needs to be collected. So this means that they had a lot of infrastructure just for monitoring these log files individually, collect them together, and then of course made them available uh, via Elasticsearch for further uh, analysis. And the other cool thing that allowed us is, was the near real-time monitoring. Because, well, uh, which systems uh, knows the best if one other system is down, those that are actually using it. And once you are not able to communicate with your other system, you can send some specific error messages that could be filtered on Kafka side and instantly, or almost instantly, could be visualized by operation guys who actually can intervene and do something with it. So this is why it was pretty important to have logging via Kafka done. Okay, so we have use cases uh, that we need to fulfill, but how actually we are doing it? So first of all, we started by making a producer. 
as you can see, we tried to do to, we tried to do this implementation quite minimalistic way, in the sense that uh, well, most of our users wanted to just use Kafka. They don't really cared what was inside there. Uh, they just had to hook now to Kafka instead of the traditional JMS that they used before. So for making this simple for them, we created the producer factory that will produce some producers uh, with a custom payload. And uh, then on that producer, the only thing that they needed was to have a send method where you can actually put your payload and send your message. Uh, it's pretty simple and should work. <laughs> actually, it's architecture, it's a bit more uh, in depth, it's a bit more complicated, but not that complicated. As you see, you have the central point is the producer factory which, of course, in the background uses the native Kafka producer API, and which will create you uh, a producer that has that uh, send message for custom payloads. Of course, you have some additional metadata informations like uh, how to secure your communication with Kafka or how to tune up your, uh, your settings for Kafka if you need it. Uh, after that, we created, of course, a consumer. It's not enough just to write some messages. You should be able to, to read it. So our idea was pretty similar with the producer part, to have it as simple as possible. So we have a consumer factory uh, we, from which we create a consumer. And to that consumer, you are able to uh, register a receiver handler. And that on your receiver handler, you can actually consume that message with your custom payload. That is actually pretty important. Uh, here you can see the payload of the message itself is a message with a payload. This is a custom message that we created, which is pretty similar with the message from Spring Messages, uh, meaning that you can add some headers and a payload. Uh, its architecture, again, is very similar with the producer. It has the consumer factory with, a native, with the native Kafka consumer API in the background and uh, from which you are creating the consumers and you can hook your register handler. Okay, so this, as we had those already the producer and the consumer, we were able actually to implement the logging part which of course uses the producer part. On the left side, actually, you see the more traditional logging way uh, from Logback. It's logging through a, with a Kafka pen, uh, sorry, with a file appender, you are logging to a file. And then on those servers, we had a so-called logstash forwarder, which was monitoring these files, and line by line, it was sending them to the Elk stack. Uh, when we implemented the Kafka way, was we implemented the Kafka appender that, of course, used our producer. And through this producer, it sent the messages to Kafka and from Kafka to an Elk stack. So this is cool. So we actually had one feature implemented that we didn't have before. But still, having a, sim a consumer and a producer, it's still not enough for the daily uh, job. And actually, it not fulfills yet uh, not fulfills more of the need that our users had. So one of the features that we actually developed was the serializer. What actually this means was that in our producer we embedded a way to allow uh, to our customers to add multiple uh, transformation units, multiple serialization units in our code what the transformation means. For instance, uh, in your messages, you could insert uh, information like the timestamp when this message was created, the server from which this message was sent, um, and I don't know, the user ID and things like that that you might need for your logic. Uh, the serialization part was uh, was allowing us to, for instance, to serialize our data as a JSON. Or uh, 
in some cases actually we needed even more we needed to have this data encrypted because it it content it had some very sensitive data and we didn't want uh, anyone to be able to read that information so, and we could chain we can chain this information so this is a feature already that we didn't have before just by using uh, vanilla Kafka uh, so this already helped us the next feature that we implemented was the filtering actually the filtering could be done in two ways on the consumer part you can actually have we actually have a filtering receiver handler as you saw in the example with the code there I had only a, uh, a um, uh, receiver handler and actually we can check if actually we want to process that information or that message or not uh, and we had the other possibilities like you are seeing here actually having another microservice that it's working as a filter we needed this because uh, some of our topics that we are using in Kafka are uh, highly monitorized and they don't want that any kind of application just connect to them and consume messages from there and they want to be able to control the access to these messages so this is why uh, it was done like this and actually what it does it reads the, the, the message uh, based on some metadata it will filter it or not uh, and if it is accepted then it's sent to another topic uh, another uh, cool uh, feature that we had was this transformer which actually is pretty similar with the one that I presented a few slides ago uh, but this again is done at the microservice level with the same reasoning because not everyone is allowed to use every topic as a uh, consumer um, another feature similar to this is a feature that we call forward and dispatch where we actually forwarding the message or replicate it for others to be used um, of course under control another very cool feature that Kafka offered us is that as some of you may know Kafka actually it's more like a buffer because it is able to retain the messages for a fixed period well for a given period of time uh, and we call this functionality replay actually what it does is uh, well as developers as you may know we are developing also some bugs how many of you are actually developing the bugs as well ah they are just you're very good developers then I, I assume the rest of you work at Google or Amazon or something right <laughs> uh, well I am also developing bugs from time to time so uh, what actually this feature does is that uh, allowed you uh, for the given amount of time to actually realize that actually you did a bug and you processed that message in a wrong way so uh, this permits you to re uh, read those messages to check if those messages were processed correctly or not and if not gives you the opportunity to reprocess it again uh, of course for those kind of systems where uh, it was pretty important that your message to be processed only once it's not working but most of our um, of most of our uh, requirements are not needing this and okay so we already had some cool features but you may ask okay but this of course will impact your performance indeed it, it impacts your performance but what we did we actually micro benchmarked uh, what we did and actually in these numbers that you see here you see uh, the time from when the user uh, had that producer dot send and until the point when we are actually sending it to Kafka the message actually we wanted to see the overhead that we have uh, how much impact uh, it uh, it does so based and actually the lighter orange is for messages 
of 500 uh, bytes and the uh, darker is for messages of 1000 bytes. As we saw, most of our messages are around 500 bytes. And with 500 bytes, we are still able to process more than 2.7 million messages uh, per second with one single producer. So uh, we were now confident that well, we can do uh, quite a good job with this. And for most of our specification, uh, this was way more than, than needed. And we went even more and we tried to see if we could turn it a bit more. And here, for, of course, smaller messages, it, these are messages of 100 uh, bytes. And with messages that small, we, could, we were able to actually send more than 9.1 million messages per second. So for corner cases, when indeed the performance requires even more, then you have to drop off some of your uh, data that it's not needed. But you can tune it up. And on logging part, well, our logging, uh, it's a bit slow compared to the, what I showed before. It's only 224,000 messages per second. But this is because in our case, we require a lot, a lot of information. These messages are mostly around 2,000 uh, uh, bytes. And beside that, we lose almost 10 microseconds because our messages are allowed to contain JSON messages. And if, in case they are JSON messages, so actually we have to check if they are JSON messages, we have to treat them a bit differently. And we do it this for each and every message. So we have there an impact. But for our systems, this was enough for what they needed. So as we saw, we had a very powerful, very performant Kafka. Uh, but with not too many features. So what we did, we tried to add some of these features on top of it. And with it, we tried to make from him a Kafka++ that could have almost the same performance as the plain Kafka, but with some of the features or more of the features that we wish we, what we had in other traditional systems that we used before. And actually, this is our message that if you invest some time, you can make your Kafka to be as uh, feature rich as your uh, other systems, but having a performance way above the others. And we were so good at this uh, and so successful that actually uh, talk with uh, actually proved to our management and say to other countries within the group that Kafka can be extendable and this is actually the uh, let's say the challenge that we open for you so you can extend Kafka uh, as you can see it's possible so you can do it we convinced our uh, management to uh, go global with Kafka so we have in ING Kafka is becoming the number one uh, Let's call it event bus, so the, the bus that will change events. And uh, we are doing development uh, right now uh, of three countries. They are doing development. Uh, one of them is Romania. The other is uh, uh, the Netherlands. And the third one is the G Germany. And uh, we are yeah, committed to have a single community, to have uh, logging uh, in place, which so far um, I don't know if it has been done before at this day, this integration with ELK. ELK, it's a Netflix solution and it should be quite uh, popular, at least in ING it is. And logging in a bank, it's like something sacred, so you don't mess with logging because it's user logging transactions, so how much money you move from one account to another, so you wouldn't want to alter that. Uh, so it's important, and uh, they are all done with uh, Kafka. And actually, we already started the process of actually making all of our code to be open source. Uh, we are Most of for it, a yeah. bank, and well, it takes a while. So this code that you see, it's still copyrighted, but maybe in some day will be open source. 
that was the reason for which we didn't get the GitHub uh, link, so if you are one. So yes, the message is use microservices with Kafka and code uh, ahead uh, of the curve. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for uh, your time. Thank you. If you have questions, feel free to... to yeah, if you have questions, we, have we have still have 10 moments. minutes. So, yeah. Whoever, okay. Yes. Uh, Mike, yes, uh, we need them. By the way, because I forgot to uh, ask you, how many of you use Kafka in production? Not that much. How many intend to use it after this presentation? <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's good, we have one. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, we need a mic here. It looks that we don't have a mic, so... Yeah, yeah, speak loud. I, I'll, I'll repeat, just send me the question and I'll tell it. Uh, the first question, uh, there are two questions. First is, uh, is uh, somehow do you have problems, do you have problems in the compatibility of the hardware with Kafka in regard of your developments? That's the first one. Okay. And the second one is uh, uh, related to the reconciliation banks. We have a lot of reconciliation. We are talking about microservice architecture and, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, you might not have some features in Kafka. How do you deal with uh, with the situation? Yeah, okay, so uh, those, there, are, there were two questions. Uh, one is uh, related to compatibility between Kafka and our development, right? Yes, our feature upgrade. And the second one is uh, how do we handle uh, reconciliation in a bank? Uh, yeah, not uh, many people, uh, if you are not working in a bank, maybe you will not know exactly what it is, reconciliation. It's a financial uh, term, right, that which somehow matches uh, our inputs with our outputs or bank inputs and outputs and make sure they, are, they level up. Uh, and I will how answer for the first question. Actually, our library, how we developed it, is it was developed so that we can plug in different versions of the native Kafka library. And this is how we target to be able to migrate for future uh, improvement. Means that a code that you are writing today will work even if you are currently you are connecting to uh, 0 0.9 or maybe in a year to 0 0.10 or even now if you are using 0 0.10. Uh, and your code should be compatible because all the incompatibilities we are trying to solve it in the background uh, for you but from 09 to 010 we didn't really had uh, issues only with the consuming part uh, but all those are solved in the background and actually the code that used 09 and now they migrated to the 010 they don't have any change to do is this answer to your first question Okay, and the second one, a reconciliation. Well, for reconciliation, we, uh, I mean, we didn't face uh, so far this use case. We didn't implement it. Uh, shouldn't be something that uh, we cannot handle it. So far, at least the, the info that I have, shouldn't be something that uh, we cannot handle it. Uh, Kafka, it's, I mean, what we did was uh, w um, with the idea that it needs to cope with almost any situation that you will face. So regardless what you throw at it, should be able to handle it. That's why, as you saw in the code, if you looked, we give a message, we don't care what it is, just give a message, whatever that message is. So I can put anything there, I can put like a message which has a body and some headers, I can do whatever I want. I can send JSON, XML, protobuf, whatever you want, I can put it there and uh, send it and use it, of course. That was the, the main reason behind it because of course, if we are talking about bank, it's always we have challenges why that, but we want that, but we want something else, and so on and so on. But mostly we are standardizing what kind of messages we are sending. Trying to. Trying to, of course. Other question, yes. Uh, just shout it loud. Just in the background. Uh, why did you use Kafka or Dutch? Which one? Oh, why do we use Kafka over NAT? I'm not, I'm not familiar with We NTAs, started to use so this 
in ING like almost three years ago. Uh, was but beside that, I, actually, I don't know about that. Yeah. So, so we are I, I don't saw a comparison between it. So maybe at the next conference, we will be able to tell you. <coughs> By the way, how we implemented our producer and consumer was also having the possibility to actually change to any other technology that we might encounter in the future. So currently it's, it's embedded with Kafka, but actually we already made some proof of concept that we can actually hook in the background a simple JMS. So I suppose that in future we might also try out that as well. And still the consumers and producers of our client API, they will not have to change almost anything. So basically with Kafka, you have in Kafka, Kafka broker, you have the performance while the producer and consumers, you have the features. This is how it works. So you can extend with the broker, you don't do anything with it. But with the producer and consumer, there is where the power of feature is. While the broker and the protocol between them, that is uh, the key to the speed. Uh, yes. There. If Can Kafka you... is fire and forget. Okay, so it's fi if Kafka is fire and forget, how we ensure the delivery of the message? But how, what did you mean by fire and forget from Kafka point of view? Ah, that we have that use case. Uh, our producer actually can send in synchronous and asynchronous. Way. The synchronous way actually means, from our point of view, is that uh, we got uh, we we get an acknowledgement from Kafka that the message was replicated and persisted, and only after that we are considering our message to be uh, uh, to be sent. And, Well, for, fortunately for this, we had some very good infra guys <laughs> that actually solved this problem. Basically, you have a cluster. You have a cluster. You can distribute it over data center, for example. I can have one node in one data center, two nodes in another data center. They are all in a virtual cluster. And this is how you solve the high availability. So if one node goes down, actually in Kafka, you have a leader, which is one node which takes the lead, and he receives the, let's say, calls. And then if the leader goes down, then there is another broker which can uh, take up the leader role. So this is how, by having in different data centers, also you ensure even geo-redundancy geo if you want. And they're trying to have it in at least two data centers. Yeah. At the same time. And you wouldn't, and I wouldn't recommend you to use, because we had this, uh, I mean, there were people coming to us and say, I want to use Kafka in synchronous way. No, Kafka is not, and you shouldn't do that. Because to using synchronous way, you will lose a lot of time. So that was the idea. I mean, I will fire and forget. I don't and give if you. And if you, you have know? to have a situation like that, then you probably don't need two million messages per yeah. second. So, so you, you shouldn't use Kafka. Use you can use kind of whatever. JMS that it's very good for that. It's not ensuring you delivery. What it's ensuring you that it, the messages were persisted on the system on which Kafka relies. Uh, that if you consumed it or not, that's another question. For example, the, uh, Robert mentioned earlier the REST comparison. So with REST, REST has a big disadvantage compared to Kafka, for example, which is exactly this message persistence. So with REST, I can make a REST call. And if I'm in a use case where each REST call counts. So I'm, I want to make sure that the call is somehow saved somehow, right? With REST, I have no guarantee. If something goes down, you know, it breaks the connection, I lost it, I have to do it again. With Kafka, you send it, that's it. You, make, you are sure that when that system, when target system is up, then the message will be delivered, so. And even if Kafka will be down, but actually we, we were able to put it down, 
uh, but if it's, if, even if it's down, when it will start up again, the mess your message was persisted, and it will be able to use it. Yeah, uh, was put down by a configuration mistake, not by because Kafka didn't. Uh... And it wasn't in production, right? Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in the benchmark that I showed, I mentioned uh, we actually we didn't test the sending of the messages itself. That was done by the guys from Confluent, and they proved with three servers that they can do uh, more than two million messages per second. What we wanted to see by these benchmarks was that the overhead that we put on the native library is still able to deliver that many messages. So we didn't send effectively the messages with replication and so on. We wanted to see that our library is able to cope, to cope with that many messages. Do you have any experience like, uh, regarding the partition number, any uh, practice for the top? I, I don't think there is a recipe for this. So uh, the, the, the question was about uh, the replication of the message. Uh, but it's not something, I think it's contextual based. So you shouldn't take, uh, if we go to LinkedIn and ask them, what is your uh, replication factor? And they will say 1,000. Oh, OK, let's use it. But no, it will not work yet. So I think the only way to actually find the exact number or the optimal number for you is that you will actually use it. This is how you will see how, how it goes. Use it, it monitor it, on the and see how it goes. As well. Some companies may have also some virtualization in the background, which of course has some other uh, issues that might arise from this. Others are using pure hardware. Uh, some are using two data centers that are located far, far away from each other. Others, they have quite close uh, uh, data centers. That depends from, from case to case. Uh, you. Ah, okay, ah. super. So, Bonus uh, point. So, two Pokemon. So, yes. Uh, LinkedIn uses Sansa to do the transforms in the Sansa library, which is the storm. Uh, after uh, it appeared like mostly about when we started our development and uh, we didn't look back. <laughs> yes. Different type of what? Consumers. Uh, actually, for well, how we are use, we used it, we had a specialized consumer for that that was able to reprocess the message again and verify if actually we were reading from the from the original uh, topic and for those messages that we found that uh, have mistakes to say so, uh, those were put on a separate topic from which it was then uh, re reprocessed. So as long as you didn't put any message on this uh, uh, replay topic, then nothing happened. Uh, but as soon as you started to put messages there, then it started to consume it as before. And also you can have use cases when well, the replay will work differently. Uh, our on time, unfortunately. Yeah. So that's why it may, sometimes you can put some logic on consumer that will act with serve that scenario, while on others you will not have. Thank you for your presence. Thank you. <laughs> and enjoy the drinks. Thank you.